Authorities in China have arrested a Vatican-appointed Catholic bishop, his seven priests, and ten seminarians. And China's announced a new three-child policy, lifting caps on its own long-held two-child policy. Why? Why now? Here to discuss this and much more is president of the Population Research Institute, author of Bully of Asia, Stephen Mosier. Steve, I, I want to begin with the arrest of Bishop Zhang, who was appointed by the Vatican and secretly ordained in 1991. The Chinese authorities say the bishop and his priests and seminarians are allegedly violating the country's new regulations on religious affairs. Now, Zhang, who heads the diocese of about 100,000 Catholics, was not approved by the state-run church even after that Sino-Vatican deal was signed. Why would the Vatican not have insisted that Zhang be recognized when they signed the deal with China, Steve? Well, here, here's the thing. We, we, uh, we now know that I don't think the Vatican insisted on, on any specific conditions uh, when the agreement was signed, uh, you know, two and a half years ago. And uh, China did. China insisted on all of the bishops who had been excommunicated in years past to be reinstated. They were. Uh, but the Vatican, for some reason, did not insist that the dozens of underground bishops uh, who are in the in the shadows, literally uh, working uh, in uh, in factories, working out of homes, trying to carry on distributing mm -hmm. the sacraments, that they be recognized by the Communist Party. So there was no uh, there was no tit for tat here. And wow. and since the agreement was signed, as far as I can see, the persecution has only gotten more intense. I mean, they sent a hundred policemen to arrest the bishop and, uh, what, seven priests and ten seminarians. Right. Uh, they're now going door to door uh, in that area of China, uh, of that diocese, and they're looking for more seminarians. And actually, they're looking for more Catholics. If, if they go into your house in this diocese, these Chinese communist police, and they see you have a crucifix or a Bible, they will confiscate the Bible, they will destroy the crucifix, and they will fine you for what? For being, for being a Catholic. So uh, wow. the persecution is not getting lighter, it's intensifying. And the regulations, my goodness, the regulations they're talking about that were passed back in January of 2020 are just uh, horrifically uh, controlling. Uh, you have to report yeah. your every move to the Chinese Communist Party. You have to report every dollar that's donated to you. Uh, you have to report every sermon that you give. You have to undergo, um, well, let's call them brainwashing sessions because that's what they are, to make sure that you don't say anything that conflicts with the party line. So the walls are closing in, Raymond, on the church in China. Now, given, given that uh, Bishop Zhang has been in prison on other occasions, what do you expect will happen to he, his priests, and the seminarians now that China's begun to enforce these new rules? Well, I think that the seminarians, we know what happens to them. They've been sent home and told they must never, ever again think about studying to become a Catholic priest. In fact, they're being told that it would be better if they gave up their Catholic faith altogether and, uh, and became, you know, obedient minions of the Chinese Communist Party. As far as the priest mm -hmm. and the bishop are concerned, the bishop is probably facing a long prison term. The priest will be told maybe they will be given an opportunity to join the patriotic church, uh, or maybe not. Maybe they will simply be laicized and sent into the countryside. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't, I mean, obviously the Communist Party can't laicize anyone, right? It, and it, But if right. the priest continues after this warning to practice his priestly ministry, uh, they will also be facing a long prison term. But I'm afraid the hammer is really going to come down on poor yeah. Bishop Chang. He should all be in, he should be in all of our prayers. I want to play something for you. This was at a press conference last week, wrapping up the fifth anniversary of Laudato Si. Uh, Cardinal Peter Turkson, who's the prefect of the dicastery for the promotion of integral human development, had this to say when asked by a reporter about dialogue with states who oppose the church on essential elements of the faith, like China. The reporter asked, can dialogue occur if one side is unwilling to listen and act? And when, when does dialogue end, and when can action and proaction be expected? Listen. From the part of the Vatican, since the relationship with China has got its own tense character on a religious tone, we approach that thing diversely. 
through the scientific evidence and scientific seminars. So when we do organize events like biodiversity, we can invite a scientist from China to participate. When we invite anything that is, doesn't have a clearly over, you know, overtly religious character, then you know the scientific evidence or whatever, then we're able to dialogue and to communicate on that level. Steve, at what point do the religious freedom violations by China need to be addressed by the Vatican before other topics like biodiversity and climate change are discussed? How long can they be silent on this? Well, I, you know, I mean, as a Catholic convert, uh, I don't think we can be silent at all about uh, preaching Christ and Christ crucified. Uh, as St. Paul said, my goodness, that should be what we talk about in season and out of season. But make no mistake mm -hmm. about it, the Chinese Communist Party doesn't want to dialogue uh, about anything. Uh, it doesn't want to dialogue about Taiwan. It wants to recapture it uh, by force if necessary. It doesn't want to dialogue about the South China Sea, about the survival of the Uyghur Muslims, about the survival of Tibetan culture. It doesn't want to dialogue about the future of the church. It wants to crush the church in China. It wants to become the all-dominant force the Chinese Communist Party does, not just in China, uh, but in the world. It wants to be a religion unto itself. That essentially is what it is. Uh, and I don't know what the point is of having... Uh, Chinese communist scientists come to the Vatican and talk about biodiversity and and completely ignore uh, the, 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 the elephant in the room, really the cross in the room, the crucifix in the room that is the suffering church in China. Yeah, religious diversity would be a better topic uh, if you're going to talk at all. Right. On Monday, the Chinese government announced that married Chinese couples may have up to three children. Now, this is a major yeah. shift from the existing limit of two children after, I guess, recent data showed a dramatic decline in birth rates uh, in China. They ended this chi one-child policy a few years ago. Does this really change anything, Steve? I mean, the government still is controlling the number of children people have. Yeah, and the policy really goes back to 1954 when Chairman Mao said, you know, as a communist country, we should control uh, reproduction just as we control production. In other words, the number of babies born, whether or not any Chinese citizen has a baby, uh, is up to the party ultimately to decide. So there's no privacy in China when it comes to mm -hmm. reproduction, childbearing. Uh, it does mark the three-child policy surprised me a little bit because it came so quickly after the two-child policy. But if right. you look at the numbers in China, uh, over the last year, the number of babies born dropped from 14.65 million down to 12 million. So they lost almost 20 percent uh, in terms of this latest birth cohort. That's a huge drop. And the reason yeah. is 40 years of anti-child, anti-people uh, propaganda. Uh, young people in China don't want to get married, and if they get married, they don't want to have uh, more than one child. Uh, Weibo, right. which is the Chinese equivalent of Twitter, has just lit up. Uh, after this new policy announcement, with people saying things like, well, I wouldn't have a third child unless the government paid me a half million dollars to do so. Uh, well, mm -hmm. the government isn't going to wind up paying everybody in China half million dollars to have children, but they may very well start telling them, for the good of the country, for the good of the party, uh, for the good of the economy, you have to have a second child or a third child. I don't think we're going to be in the voluntary state very long. Raymond, I think we're going to go from voluntary to involuntary very quickly. After all, this is a communist party that for decades forced millions and millions of women to get forced abortions, some in the third trimester pregnancy, some in the very pangs of childbirth were being forcibly aborted. It would not hesitate to force women to have children. So we may be seeing in years to come down the road, we may be seeing forced pregnancy. The party, party officials in China are already talking about banning condoms, banning contraceptives and banning abortion, uh, believe it or not. Not because they think it's immoral, but because they need more workers and soldiers. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, there, there's always an ulterior motive here, but it is interesting how quickly they're shifting. Uh, I want to move quickly on to Taiwan. You mentioned it a moment ago. Uh, Fast and Furious actor John Cena uh, apologized to China for calling Taiwan a country. In an interview he did with a Taiwanese broadcaster earlier this month, Cena got serious pushback from the Chinese. China is now, of course, the world's biggest movie market, and Cena who apparently has been speaking Mandarin and learning it for 10 years, said this.
中国跟中国人，我很很抱歉对俄国的错误。The groveling there is embarrassing, uh, Steve. What are we wow. seeing here? What are we witnessing in the macro? <laughs> well, I, I, I think that if he's been studying Chinese for ten years and that's that's all he can say, he's he better he better um, uh, find another hobby uh, because uh, the Chinese was broken and and barely barely understandable. But he did grovel. He did say, "I'm really, really, really sorry." Uh, the fact is, it, it didn't do him any good because they basically shut down his movie in China anyway. The box office receipts plummeted because in China, if you if you cross a line, as far as the Chinese Communist Party is concerned, they will brutally retaliate. And so he groveled for nothing. He kowtowed for nothing. He should have, uh, you know, kept his integrity intact and, and just moved on to make another movie. Mm. Uh, Brent Christensen, uh, the director of the American Institute in Taiwan, the de facto U.S. embassy, yeah. told an online news conference last week, quote, our obligation to support Taiwan in maintaining a sufficient self-defense capability against coercion remains a foundational element of the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, Steve, will the U.S. continue to support Taiwan under the Biden administration? Yeah, I, I really hope so. I lived in Taiwan for several years. I speak uh, Taiwanese, Mandarin, and Cantonese. So I have many friends on Taiwan. Uh, you have on Taiwan, you know, 23 million uh, free Chinese. Uh, Taiwan did everything that we asked them to in the 1950s and 60s. They modernized, they democratized. Uh, they've been a full-fledged democracy for the last quarter century. They've had, uh, you know, a half a dozen elections. They've had a peaceful transfer of power from one political party to another, uh, which is the ultimate test of a democracy, right? Peacefully transferring power after an right. open and free election. Uh, they're a model of democracy for China, and that's why they have to survive. They show the Chinese people on the mainland that there's hope, that there's hope for freedom, that there's hope for human rights, because in in Taiwan, those things are respected. In China, of course, they're not. So uh, we have an obligation, I think, to contribute to Taiwan's defense, uh, not just for Taiwan, not just for the people there, but for the people of China and really for, uh, for peace in the world. Mm -hmm. They're having trouble getting uh, COVID vaccines. And the, the Taiwanese are saying the Chinese have blocked a deal with Germany to get those vaccines. Is this all part of the plan? The, the, the Chinese using every instrument they can to isolate and, in this case, even imperil Taiwan and the people there? Absolutely. They're trying to put as much pressure on Taiwan as possible. But the, the, the good news is that the more pressure they put on Taiwan, the more the Taiwanese people who are free realize uh, that they don't want to be enslaved by the Chinese Communist Party. And the greater the percentage of people who say, we will fight if China invades. And, and that, of course, is the best defense uh, that Taiwan has against this kind of uh, fifth column, uh, united front tactics, the economic pressure that China puts on Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And the good news is that Japan has now agreed, over China's objections, to sell vaccines to Taiwan. So Taiwan apparently has found right. another source for vaccines. Stephen Mosher, we will leave it there. And Steve's book, Bully of Asia, is a must read. It's available in bookstores everywhere and online. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.